Good morning, everybody. We want to welcome you here and thank you for joining us. We want to especially, again, welcome all of those that are uh, joining us online. Um, uh, we were commenting just this morning about how different this is and how the church has faced crises many times in the past, but uh, how we have had to adapt to things that we never would have thought we would have needed to adapt to just a few short weeks ago. Uh, we were commenting on how the church has always been gathered together corporately in a physical place, and now we are gathering together in a digital place, and how strange and how new and how different that is and that must feel. But I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, we are still... Uh, we have still closed down our, our facilities. We are only meeting online during this time that the governor has issued a mandatory stay at home. And, uh, um, and so we are working through that and uh, dealing with uh, new things and working through new things as we, as we deal with that. So um, with that in mind, we are going to continue to meet like this uh, for... Um, uh, on a week-by-week -week basis and uh, for the next several weeks at least uh, in order to uh, allow this virus to subside, in order to keep people as safe as possible, in order to uh, allow the church to continue to meet but do so in a way that will uh, continue to help public health. So I, I want to thank you again for joining us and, and being a part of this strange journey uh, that our church is going through. Um, we are learning on our feet and trying new things every day, trying to make improvements every day. And so I thank you for your feedback. I thank you mostly for your patience and for your grace as we come together and try to figure these things out. So um, I want to make you aware of a few things. Uh, Really, the difficult part right now, not only in not meeting together, the all other difficult part right now is planning and our church calendar. Uh, things are just up in the air right now, and there are things being canceled right and left. Um, one of the big things that got canceled this past week was uh, our district assembly in July. Uh, our district leadership has decided to forego that activity this coming July because 90% uh, of other districts around our area and around our country have already done so. Uh, for many of you that are not familiar with the Church of the Nazarene, you, you may not even know what that means, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but the district assembly for our church is where we come together in order to elect district leaders and uh, conduct di district business. And so it's a big event in the life of our church that happens every year in Summersville, West Virginia, but this year it will not happen. And uh, that, that is the first time in the history of our district um, that that has taken place. There will be a special asterisk in our district journal saying that we did not meet this year. And going all the way back to um, when we were one district, uh, and not just West Virginia North and South districts, that divide happened in 1983-84, but going all the way back even to uh, 1941 when we were part of the Pittsburgh district, all of West Virginia, um, that has never happened. So we're, again, we're in new territory and, and uh, we're trying to come up with new ways of doing things. So um, we will make uh, information available to you in the best way that we have. Right now, the best way to communicate with uh, all of you is through Facebook Live and our NAS News Feed, uh, also through the uh, prayer chain and that uh, sends out telephone calls as well as texts. And uh, anything beyond that, uh, we're relying on word of mouth. Uh, we want to encourage you to continue to contact people, to call people, to check in on them, uh, to call them, to text them, to uh, uh, do uh, what it is that you would do in person if you were able to meet in person, but do it digitally or do it through the phone lines. So uh, this is the time where the church can come together. This is the time where the church can reach out to one another and be a part of our, of our lives only in different ways. So I want to continue to think along those lines and to continue to do that. Uh, again, we are adjusting our calendar as needed, and many things in the foreseeable future are up in the air. 
And uh, again, we will make you aware of those changes as they come along. And um, we are just trying uh, to do our best to, to work through this difficult time. So uh, with that being said, we want to come together and we want to worship. And one of the ways that we come together is through celebrating important events. And it was pointed out to me that Red and Charlotte Hunter's anniversary is today. Um, we would stand up and cheer and clap for them uh, if we were assembled today in this place, uh, but we're not. So I, I'd encourage you today and even tomorrow to reach out to Red and, and Charlotte uh, Hunter. You can find them in the church directory. Uh, if you would like a church directory, uh, you can swing by the church and, and we'd be happy to pass one out to you, um, uh, to your car as, as it's uh, available. So uh, we just wanted to make you uh, aware of that. And uh, again, uh, thank you for all of, those, all of those that are posting things in the NAS news feed, that are reaching out to their neighbors, that are looking after people. Um, this is when the church shines. This is when the church comes together and says, this is why we do what we do, because the peace of God that reigns in our heart and reigns in our life. So as we're here today, um, we want to come together and to worship God and to thank him for what it is that he's doing. So again, if we were gathered together, I'd ask you to stand, but we're going to stand. You can continue to worship where you are in, in your home, and let's gather together today in Jesus' name. Let's worship him.
presence. Lord, we're thirsty for you and we need you. Lord, we give you the praise and the honor and the glory. We invite you into this place. We invite you into our homes. We invite you to wherever we are meeting with you today. I pray in Jesus' name that you help us to hear your voice. We ask this.
Lord, you are welcome in our homes and where we're meeting. Lord, you're, you're welcome in, in many places across this nation, across our country, across our area, across our cities and towns. And Lord, we are relying on you in ways we never thought or imagined. And so, Lord, we pray and we ask in Jesus' name, that you would speak to us afresh and anew, Lord, that this opportunity, this time of uncertainty, this time of, of new challenges, Lord, I pray that you would help us to trust you. Lord, we are thirsty for you. And Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you would guide us and direct us. Lord, we, we come to you today and expressing our deep desire for you, our desire in the midst of the turmoil and the uneasiness that these new challenges that we are facing as, as a society, as a people, as a culture, as a nation, Lord, as a, as a world, Lord, what we've been going through over the last few weeks and possibly weeks to come are, is unprecedented. So, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us to turn to you all the more. Lord, that we would come to you with fresh faith and a fresh desire to be in your presence. So, Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Lord, we, we lift up to you those that have passed away over the last week and several days. Lord, as these extenuating circumstances prohibit gathering together in, in large groups, we pray for the families of those loved ones that have been lost. We, we pray that you would help them as they mourn, as they postpone services or hold greatly reduced ones. Lord, we pray of we pray for Don Mitchell's family as they as they mourn his loss. Lord, I thank you for his life. I thank you for his testimony and his witness. I thank you for the music that he played and for the hearts that he uplifted. And Lord, I thank you that he is now with you. Lord, that is the greatest comfort that we could ever ask for or imagine. And Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you would comfort Sharon, that you would comfort the rest of his family, Don and John and uh, Joy and Chris and and uh, Bud in Florida, we pray for uh, Don's uh, sons and his their families. Lord, we pray that you would be with them and, and help them as they go through this difficult time of mourning the loss of their father. Lord, we give them to you today. We pray for others, including Patty, Con uh, Patty Collins' father who passed away. We pray that you'd be with her and, and help her family. We pray that you'd help them as they too are not able to gather together but have to postpone services. Lord, we pray for Jerry Gooch's family and, and how they are waiting to have a memorial service for him. Lord, we pray for others that are in the same situation. We pray that you'd be with them and help them in Jesus' name. And Lord, again, we come to you and we pray for those who are on the front lines of providing care for those with this virus, for those who are discovering that they may be infected. Lord, we pray for health care workers. We pray for firefighters and law enforcement and EMTs. Lord, we pray that you would be with them and help them. Lord, we pray for doctors and nurses and other health care professionals that they would stay safe through all of this. And Lord, we pray for their families as they too are being thrust on the front lines of all that is going on. Lord, we think specifically today for, for Dalen and Kayla and Thea, Thea Pennington. We pray for, for them as they are waiting and trying to figure things out in light of, of exposure. Lord, we pray that you would be with them. Give them peace beyond all measure. We pray for their families. We pray for, for Jerry and Penny as they too are, are wrestling and struggling and praying and, and asking for your guidance and your direction in the life of their families and the life of their loved ones. So Lord, we give them to you today. We pray that you be with them and help them. Lord, Lord we, 
We pray for others that have been in, that, that have been infected or seem to have been infected. Lord, we pray for this homeschool family that we've been praying for for these all these weeks and months who are struggling with cancer and, and a variety of different things and now to be exposed to this virus as well. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you would be with them and keep them safe. Lord, I pray that you would help them. And Lord, we reach out to you today and we pray in Jesus' name as we have prayed many times this week and pray continually. Lord, I pray that you would stop this virus in its tracks. Lord, I pray that you would allow it to reach its high water mark, that you would allow it to reach its its threshold and then go no further. So Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, we implore you in Jesus' name that you would protect those who are in need of protecting. And Lord, we pray that you would allow this virus to dissipate and go away. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that this would be the reality that we face in the next few weeks. Lord, it's hard to know fact from fiction. It's hard to know truth from fabrication. It's hard to know pure conjecture versus uh, uh, fact-based understanding or truth. In all that we've been seeing and hearing through the media and on a variety of different places. So, Lord, when we cannot trust the truth from any other place, we go to you, the way, the truth, and the life. For you are truth itself. And, Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name and ask for your guidance and direction in our hearts and in our life. Lord, again, we come to you and we pray for our schools as they have as they have done a a significant pivot, as we have teachers that are now teaching from home, teaching online, as we are, as our churches are, are moving to a digital format. Lord, we pray for students who are at home trying to get work done to finish out their year and teachers as they offer guidance and direction. Lord, we pray for administrators who, who are working still. Lord, we pray for those that rely on the schools for, for food and for sustenance. Lord, we pray that you would uh, be with all of the needs in our area. Lord, there are so many people that are facing uncertainty. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd continue to be with our schools, that you would allow them to get better with each and every day, that, Lord, this year, once it's, it's passed and in the books, would lead to a great and new year as we look forward to the fall. Lord, I believe that you can do that, and I pray that you would in Jesus' name. So, Lord, we give this to you. Lord, we pray for those that are in that are, are at risk for complications because of pre-consisting uh, uh, health concerns in their life. Lord, we pray for those that have cancer and, and other health ailments, especially those that deal with the lungs. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you'd be with them and help them through this difficult time. Lord, my heart goes out to those mothers who are preparing to give birth in just a few days or weeks to come how they have been severely limited in the number of family or friends that are able to be there. Lord, how they risk exposure going to the hospitals in order to provide care in this time of giving birth. So Lord, we pray for their safety as well. Lord, we give them to you today. Lord, we pray for those who are having severe family issues. Based on the quarantine, based on staying together for extended periods of time, how this has brought about underlying issues for many people. Lord, I pray for those that are just desperate to be around people yet again. I pray that you'd be with them. Help them through this time as well. And Lord, there are many who would offer up unspoken requests. Lord, they can even speak them out now as they're in the comfort of their own homes. They they can speak the words in Jesus' name and say them aloud as they are there in the comfort of their own homes watching from afar. So Lord, I pray for those that would have unspoken requests. Lord, as they speak them out even now, as, as you hear them, as you know the situation even better than we can articulate them, We pray in Jesus' name that you would make a way for them where there seems to be no way. And Lord, we also pray most of all for those that are in desperate need of a saving knowledge of your Son, Jesus. 
Lord, there are many who need to turn to you in this time of uncertainty. Lord, I pray for them that you would make a way for them. And Lord, I pray for us who know you. I pray for Christians that you would embolden us and give us the opportunity to share our faith, whether on Facebook, whether on the phone, whether in different avenues, or from afar, yelling from one porch to the next as we talk to our neighbor. Lord, I pray that you'd make us a witness for you in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you give us peace that passes all understanding so that when others look and see and ask, why are you so calm through all of this turmoil? We can offer the reason simply as you. Lord, you give peace in the midst of the storms of life. And we thank you for that. So Lord, as we come to you today, we give of ourselves afresh and anew. We thank you in advance. We know that you are the all-present everywhere God, and this is shown in full effect as we are worshiping in so many different places. So Lord, we praise you and thank you. We ask all of these things in the matchless, holy name of Jesus. And all God's people say, At this point in our service, we take the opportunity to uh, give of our tithes and our offerings, to uh, give back to God a portion of what it is that he so richly blessed us with, to uh, offer to him uh, rights over every area of our life, including our finances. And so uh, we are, are pivoting and changing and allowing different things to happen in light of that as well. So many people have sent in their tithes and offerings this week through the mail. Many have used online giving, which has been available now uh, through uh, the NAS news feed. There's a link there that you can be able to find and search. Uh, there are also opportunities to simply drop it off here at the local church when uh, time allows. So uh, if you have questions on that, please feel free to contact the church office. And we'd be happy to help you with that. And again, thank you for your continued giving and faithfulness to God through this difficult time. Would you pray for me? Uh, pray for me through this service and through this difficult time. But allow me to pray and ask God to bless these tithes and offerings that we have been receiving and continue to receive. In Jesus' name. Lord, again, we come to you, never tiring of opportunities and times to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, this is the same. And we pray in Jesus' name. That you would bless and receive these tithes and offerings. Use them for the furthering of your kingdom both here and around the world. We give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, through all of this we do see some good things that are happening. If you've been watching the news and stuff. You see where distilleries are making hand sanitizers. Uh, you see where auto factories, they're making parts for respirators. You know, so it, there, are, there are some good out there. Pastor, you put some scripture on Facebook I was looking at. In the last part of it, it says, Hezekiah's words put steel, put steel in their spines. That was great. That's, that's in 2 Chronicles 32, 7 through 8. And, you know... When it all comes down to it, where is your faith? Where, where is your strength? And uh, I also have to do this. I, I know she's watching, and I, I, Ella, I hope you can see me, sweetheart. I love you. <laughs> Good morning. Okay, Mike. <laughs> It's all been said and done. There is just one thing that matters. Did I do my best to live for truth? 
could I live my life for you? When it's all been said and done, all my treasures will mean nothing. Only what I've done for love's reward will stand the test. Turn in your Bibles this morning to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Once uh, you have found that particular verse or chapter, I would ask you if you are able to, to Stand with me, and we will read this together. Galatians chapter 2, beginning with verse 16, you can follow along on the screen behind me, it says this, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. But if, in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Lord, again, we come to you and we thank you for the gift of your word. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to trust you, to come to you in 
Thank you for this opportunity to gather even from afar. So, Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us today. We pray all these things in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as you know, uh, we've been going through the 16 articles of faith for the Church of the Nazarene, and this particular article of faith is number nine. And it's strange, and it's, it's different because it has three parts to it. The three parts in this article are justification, regeneration, and adoption. And man, that's a, that's a mouthful. That's a whole lot. So let's break it down and look at the very first one. The very first one that, that we find here is the article uh, that we believe, what we believe about justification. Now, justification is actually a legal term. It means that we're caught red-handed. We're caught red-handed in sin. There's, there is no question. There is no doubt of our guilt. We deserve the punishment. And everything that is headed our way for being guilty. This is what happens when you have technical problems. This first part about justification is a legal term. Talking about the idea and the fact that when we have been caught in sin, we deserve the punishment that we are headed for. That we are headed for being... Uh, Punishment. We are headed for sin and guilt and all that it means. So as we are headed in that direction, though, God halts that move towards punishment. Kind of like the governor staying an execution. We were given a reprieve, and the guilty person, the offender, the one deserving punishment, ends up going free. Before we moved to Wellsburg, we lived on the Grafton Road in Morgantown. And I can remember one, one day in particular. It, it, was, it was not unlike yesterday, really. It was a beautiful spring day. I had just left the house in the morning in order to make my way to the district office where I was working at the, at the time. And as I pulled out from our driveway, I, I don't know about you, but there was something about that beautiful day that my, my foot just got a little heavier than normal. You've been there in that situation. You know what I'm talking about. And as I go up the hill and go around the corner, there he sits. Right there at a little turn-off section. A state trooper for West Virginia. <laughs> and man, as I turn the corner, as I see him, I see his wheels start to move as I have come around the corner. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's got me. He was waiting for somebody like me, and he found me. Now, since that time, I mean to let you in on a little secret. Something that I have discovered. This is totally extra for you, but you can take it to the bank. I have discovered how to avoid getting a speeding ticket. I have discovered how to avoid getting a speeding ticket 100% of the time. There are many things in life that are not 100%, but I'm here to tell you that what I'm about to say goes 100% of the time. And that is, if you want to avoid a speeding ticket, don't speed. That's the truth. Well, I wasn't able to take my own advice. I guess I wasn't able to quite learn that lesson at that point. And so as I came around that corner, as I was going down the hill, because, you know, gravity was working in my favor, I saw the state trooper begin to move his wheels before I ever got past him. 
I knew I was caught. He had caught me red-handed, there was no question. And as I was going up the other hill, the very first place I saw to pull off was a, was a driveway right past a guardrail. And as I pulled off, I stopped. I rolled down my windows, and I even got my license and registration ready. I looked in my rearview mirror, and this state trooper came up behind me. His, his lights were already on, but you could tell that he was not going as fast as he normally would. Because I had slowed down and pulled over really before he had even been able to pull out, turn around, and come after me. And he comes up after a few moments, and he asked me for my license and registration. I hand it to him. He says... Do you know why I pulled you over today, sir? I said, absolutely. I was speeding, and I apologize. We had a slight conversation, and, and he even thanked me for not having to, quote-unquote, chase me. I think typically at that point, people would have gone up and over the hill and waited for him to come up behind them with his lights in order to pull over. I pulled over because I knew. As soon as I saw his wheels start to move, I knew I was guilty. He checked a few things and he came back and he again thanked me for pulling over so quickly. And he said, I'm going to let you go with a warning. I thanked him for that. I thanked him for that because in that moment, he justified me in the eyes of the law. You see, he had every right to write me that ticket. I deserved that ticket. But he thanked me for acknowledging my guilt in the situation, for not potentially putting other people at risk, for having, making him have to speed up and over a hill. And he let me go with a warning. That's justification. I remember back when I was in Mount Vernon and I was there um, as a student and one of the classes that I took um, was with a newly retired professor, semi-retirement. He was still back for a few classes. His name was Dr. McCall and he had taught Greek in uh, in the religion department at Mount Vernon for years and years and years. He was one, if I remember correctly, I have to look up to be sure, he was one of the founding faculty members of Mount Vernon. So that tells you how long he had been there. If you know Dr. McCall, you know he speaks with a very thick southern accent. So there is an entire generation of Nazarene pastors that understand Greek with a thick southern accent. One of the things that I remember about Dr. McCall and him teaching us is when he taught us about justification. He said there's the word justification in Greek that we translate into English in justification. But if you really want to translate it, if you really want to know what it means, it means to be made righteous. He said, in fact, if we were to really translate it well, we would say righteous five instead of justified. <coughs> Excuse me. I washed my hands because I didn't cough into my elbow. I apologize for that. New social order. So one of the things that, that we need to understand, the important aspect of justification is this component of righteousness. You see, righteous five is not a word. We can't just make it up, although that best describes what justification is. And so we, we understand it in that way. Now, this second term, the second term in this group of three is regeneration. Now, if you're familiar with regeneration, you know that it's a biological term. Justification was a legal term. Regeneration is a biological term. Did you know that, that even now your cells in your body are constantly regenerating themselves? They are regrowing themselves, renewing and restoring themselves. And the moment that the cells in your body stop regenerating themselves is the moment you begin to die. 
You know, I, I believe that some reptiles even, if they are to lose an arm or an appendage or a tail even, that they have the ability to regenerate that appendage, to regrow it, that which was lost. And you know the most famous example of regeneration in the Bible is actually in John chapter 3. It's the story of Jesus talking with Nicodemus. Nicodemus, if you know, is part of the ruling class. He's one of the Pharisees. And he, he sneaks in by cover of darkness in order to speak with Jesus, this new rabbi. And, and as he talks with him and, and converses with him, he begins to ask him questions that are on his heart and his mind. And, and Jesus just comes out and says to him the basic thing that you need to know in your relationship with God. And he says, Nicodemus... You must be born again. Nicodemus says, Rabbi, how? How am I, an old man, supposed to re-enter my mother's womb in order to be born again? Jesus says, Nicodemus, you're supposed to know this. You're supposed to know this and tell others you're a teacher of Israel. And he says the verse that we all know so well in John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not come into the world to condemn the world. But that the world might be saved him. You see, faith in Jesus leads to rebirth. Faith in, in Jesus leads to new life in Christ. A new creation regenerated from what was lost and being made and then being made whole again. Man, I'm telling you, that's good news. That's good news yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's good news today in light of a pandemic, in light of an uncertainty that happens over the course of this life. What was, what was lost has been found. What was dead has been raised to new life. What was distorted beyond recognition will be made fresh and, in fact, better than ever. You see, when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, then we are saved from our sin. That's what that term means, that when we, when we are saved. Saved from what? Saved from sin and death. We are justified before God. We are justified before the law. We are made righteous and whole. And then we are also adopted. Do you know what? Justification is a legal term. Regeneration is a biological term. Adoption is a social term. You see, we were separated from God in our sin, in our death. We were estranged from God's family. Always on the outside looking in. But then something miraculous happened. God welcomed us into his family. God threw open the doors and removed the barriers that separated us. God pulled down the obstacles and welcomed us in. Even more than that, God makes us co-heirs with Christ. Not just second-class citizens, not just always marked to be off to the side and, and kept away, never seen or heard. We're not talking about stepchildren in God's family. We are talking about full-fledged, equal rights as children of God in Christ. Man, that is good news. And that happens when we put our faith and trust in the work of Jesus on the cross. John 3.16, like we said a moment ago. And then we are born of the Spirit. Look at John chapter 3, verse 4, 4 and 5. Jesus answered. He answered Nicodemus and said, Truly I say to you, 
Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. You know, uh, we've, had, we've had several friends go through the process of adoption in their family. I'm sure there are, there are many uh, even watching today that have gone through that process as well. Uh, it's no small task. It takes years of time and dedication to see the process through. It takes a considerable amount of money in order to make this adoption happen. There, there's one story in particular that I read of a, of a family who struggled to get pregnant. The man uh, was, a, was a, uh, a serviceman and, and he and his wife, uh, after his deployment, were trying to get pregnant after they were married and, and uh, they just were not having uh, the results that they had hoped to have. And so they eventually decided to go through the adoption process. Uh, they were able to find a beautiful young baby in order to adopt and they began with fostering and moved later to adoption. And it took almost two years. And so this baby that they've had from the very beginning, who is now almost two years old, they finally come to the final court date where this young child will finally, legally, really become theirs. The story goes that as, as the judge lowers the gavel for the very last time in the adoption process to make this family whole in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of, of the state, that as the gavel comes down, this young, almost two-year-old looks over without any hesitation and yells out, Dad! And begins to clap. And the whole courtroom begins to laugh and clap along with this new family, this new loved one, as the adoption is made final. You see, the same happens for us when we receive the, the spirit of adoption. As, in, as Romans 8, 15, and 16 says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So, all of these, justification, regeneration, and adoption, all of them happen at the same time in the heart of a believer. After we, we, after we repent and turn to God, we are awakened to this new life in Jesus, and that's the moment of our salvation. But it is not... An opportunity to cover or to hide sin from God. Because there is nothing hidden from God. Salvation is a new life and produces a new creation. You see, the old is gone. And it's fading away. The new has come. 2 Corinthians 5.17 if anyone is therefore in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new is come. The, there's a story I heard of an old preacher. You may have heard it before, you may not have, but uh, this old preacher told a story about being called in front of a, a court in a local country courthouse. Now, that probably, you probably want to hear that story because, you know, you like hearing stories, especially about the pastor getting pulled over by a state trooper and things like that. So this particular preacher was telling about how he ended up in front of the judge in a small country courthouse, not unlike this one that you see behind him. He tells of, of being caught red-handed at breaking the law. He was told to show up at a particular day for his meeting with the judge. And as he reported to the courthouse, he was met by the bailiff. 
this big strapping gentleman in his uniform and and he brought him in and sat him down and, and told him to wait his turn and and as the judge progressed and went through the other cases he eventually came to this preacher the bailiff instructed him to go and sit down at the table that you see there in the courtroom the judge who was there behind the bench looked down and and said to the man who was there he said sir do you do you have someone to represent you in this case today? The man said, Judge, I, I don't. I don't have anyone to stand for me. The judge said, that's fine. And he looked over to a group of lawyers who were standing alongside the wall. And he pointed to one and said, come over. You're going to represent this young man as a court appointed lawyer. The preacher said as he was sitting there and as he looked at that young lawyer walking across the courtroom to him, his, his heart, for some reason, immediately started to rebound. He looked at that young lawyer and his handsome face and he knew immediately that that was someone he could put his faith and trust in. And he was grateful for that young man who he had never met before that day to come to his rescue and to help him during this difficult time. He sat down next to the preacher and said, young man, I need to know. Are you innocent or are you guilty? We need to enter a plea into this court. Young man said, sir, I, I'm guilty. There's no question of my guilt. My hands are red. My heart is heavy. There's no question that I need to enter a guilty plea. The lawyer said, okay. He turned to the judge and said, sir, we'd like to enter a plea of guilt on behalf of my client. And from that moment on, the lawyer and the judge began to converse back and forth. The young preacher who was sitting there in that, in that courtroom began to realize over the course of their conversation that I think there was a relationship with the judge and that lawyer that he had not yet realized. Over the course of the judge and the lawyer talking back and forth, this young man began to realize that I think that the judge and my lawyer are related somehow. In fact, if I start to pay attention to some of their facial features, it becomes pretty obvious that they are probably father and son. And then the lawyer does something remarkable. He stands at the end of his conversation with the judge and says, Your Honor, my client has admitted his guilt. He throws himself at the mercy of the court. In fact, Your Honor, I would ask that whatever grace would be shown to me, his lawyer, personally, I'd ask that you extend to him. Allow me to stand in his place. He steps to one side and says, Father, if I can talk to you for just a moment. I believe he's worth extending grace to. And I ask that you would. Now, in case you haven't picked up on it, the story that this preacher was telling was not of an actual courtroom, but instead it was an old country church. Instead of standing at the bar, he was holding on to the back of a pew. Instead of 
facing an actual judge, he was imagining a courtroom in light of God the Father and God the Son dealing with the sin and guilt in his life. The judge is God the Father, his lawyer is God the Son, and that big old bailiff was the Holy Spirit. And as he threw himself on the mercy of the court, his lawyer stood up and said, whatever grace you would give to him, whatever grace you would give to me, pass on to him. And the judge ruled in his favor. And at that moment, he stood justified in light of God's law. In that moment, he received grace that only the son would receive from his father. And in that moment, he was regenerated to a place he never would have been. Except by God's saving grace. The psalmist says in Psalm 46, verse 2 Therefore I will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. In the New Testament, Matthew chapter 7 says, if you know how to give good gifts to your friends, to your family, to your children, how much more does your Heavenly Father know how to give good gifts to you? God knows what you need, and He'll provide. Paul said that you're in God's family now. If you've turned to God and you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, then the spirit of adoption will take up residence in your heart. You see, in Him we live and move and have our being. Don't worry about your life. To live is Christ, to die is gained, as Paul said. Instead, worry about being about your Father's business, because we are in His family now. This is so relevant to today because of this. With all of the uncertainty that this virus provides in our life, in our culture, with all of the things that we go through and, and are simply unable to control, we can rest assured that our Heavenly Father will provide everything that we need. That we can know that we are justified in the light of God's law. That we are regenerated and made into a new creation in Christ. That we are adopted into God's family. So I want to ask you today. Is this something that you have found in your life? If not, you may find yourself in a similar situation that this old preacher found himself in. Feeling as though you're standing before a judge with no hope of ever getting off. But then putting your faith and trust in Jesus provides that opportunity for him to usher us into his presence his family. Would you pray with me? Lord, we desperately need you. More now than we ever could have thought or imagined. So Lord, I, I pray that you would provide a way for us. Lord, all of the 
issues, all of the uncertainty, all of the things that are facing our world today. Lord, we put our faith and our trust in you. Lord, I thank you for opportunities like this to flex our faith muscles, to see the things that we need to yet surrender to you, that we need to yet give to you. So, Lord, I ask in Jesus' name that you would pour out your spirit on your church, on your people, that you would allow us to grow closer to you that so so much closer that we've never been before. Lord, that we would trust you like we've never trusted before. And that we would know what it's like to stand justified before you, made righteous in your sight. That we would know what it's like to be regenerated, to be made new, and to be ushered into your family. Lord, we ask that you'd go with us today. Keep us safe and allow us to live each day, each moment for you. We ask these things in the precious, matchless name of Jesus. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.